Hello. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to the last Uncomfortable Learning Talk of the year. We've had a lot of questions throughout uh, the series on our name. It seems kind of silly. Uh, when Ben and James approached me uh, with the idea of naming a series Uncomfortable Learning, I thought it was a pretty terrible idea. Who wants to be told they're going to be uncomfortable? However, over time, through planning the series and hearing the speakers, I began to understand why it was such a great concept. I began to understand Ben and James's vision. There's no learning without being uncomfortable. One cannot learn and grow without being challenged and made to think. As students, we must strive to critically analyze our views, ensure that we do not refuse to, that we don't refuse to hear the voices that challenge us. A rigorous education cannot exist without feeling uncomfortable sometimes. It is when we neglect to challenge our views do we lose some of our ability to learn. We begin to categorically to reject others' views because of their affiliation, resort to name-calling, and refuse to engage in an open and respectful discussion. It is here we fall into petty factions, pit one side against the other, and lose our willingness to listen. This is where we aim to help. At any college, especially one as isolated as Williams, we run the risk of creating such an echo chamber, a purple bubble even, where reason debate can be drowned out by, part, by partisan voice. Because of this risk, the spirit of the series is to bring speakers who run counter to the campus orthodoxy, regardless of political affiliation. We wish to bring the best and the brightest minds from outside to challenge us and to be the voice in the crowd brave enough to say, let me beg to differ. Now, it probably goes without saying why we brought Michael Needham to campus tonight. As a CEO of the most powerful conservative ad advocacy organization in the entire country, he has, been a, he has a voice that is not often heard at Williams College, a voice that can challenge us. And in the spirit of our discussion, this, our speaker has agreed to deliver a short speech and answer questions. So think hard on what you can ask him. So thank you all for coming. We are thrilled to welcome home this evening our fellow Eve, Michael Needham. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm going to spend most of the next 20 minutes criticizing the Republican Party, so I'm not sure that I'm giving a different perspective, but um, at least it'll be from the right. Um, but no, thanks for having me. It's good to be back at my alma mater. Um, I spend most of my time talking to 80-year-old conservative donors, and so they look at me and they kind of think that I can be the voice of college students. What do, what do the youth think about this issue? How do we, how do we communicate better to the youth? Um, so it's good to be here and actually be able to hear what the youth actually believe. Um, and it's good because it makes me feel like an 80-year-old conservative um, being in front of you all. But uh, I enjoyed, I was reading on the way up the description of my event, and uh, it mentioned a wonderful profile the New Republic did of me. Um, which mentioned that uh, if you think that the Republican Party is embarrassing yourself, you should blame Michael Needham. Um, and so I'm glad to be back here so I can thank in person my professors, Professor McAllister, Professor McDonald. I couldn't have done it without your mentorship and everything that I learned here. So thank you for empowering me to embarrass the Republican Party. Um, my goal here tonight is basically to make you as cynical as possible about what's going on in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm sure many of you are cynical about our nation's political process. You should be. Um, and I hope that I can make you a little bit more cynical because um, uh, it's true. Um, I remember when I was at Williams, Jon Stewart went on a show back then that existed, Crossfire. It's now back. It's the uh, lowest rated show on cable TV, rightly so. And he looked at them and it was Tucker Carlson and uh, Paul Begala who would get on and it was basically the WWE of politics. And he'd say, stop. You are hurting our country. Um, and he was right. Everything that happens in Washington, D.C. is basically a food fight um, that is aimed at avoiding the type of conversations that we should have, the types of conversations I had when I was at uh, Williams with Professor Crow, who was a year older than me and um, a member of the record editorial board with me, um, but about tough questions about what the proper relationship is between government, society, and the individual, um, and instead is about getting reelected, turning this into a red team versus blue team dynamic. Um, and trying to drive as much turnout from your base as possible so you can get elected and then you can empower and give riches uh, to the special interests that support your side. Um, it is commonly said Washington is broken. Washington is absolutely not broken. Washington is a finely tuned machine that is delivering exactly what it is constructed to deliver and that is benefit to various special interests um, who know how to lobby Washington, D.C. And let me give you a couple of examples of this. 
Um, there is a very active effort underway right now to ban e-cigarettes, um, or if not ban them, then at least to regulate them. E-cigarettes seem to me to be a pretty good innovation. People get caught smoking. Water vapor and nicotine helps people quit smoking. And we all know the story. It's a very easy story, and politics is ultimately about stories. Big tobacco doesn't want people quitting smoking, and so they're trying to regulate or ban e-cigarettes. The problem with this story is it's not true. Most of the e-cigarettes are actually owned by the tobacco companies. The people trying to regulate e-cigarettes out of existence are the pharmaceutical companies, because you face a choice in terms of how you quit smoking. You can either use the patch with pharma owns, or you can use e-cigarettes. And so while cigarettes are an attempt by, e-cigarettes are an attempt by the tobacco companies to take a dwindling market share and capture some of those people who are quitting on products that they own, Big Pharma is trying to stop that from happening so that they can make sure that the patch, their solution, uh, is maintained. Mattel makes toys, Barbie dolls, um, other toys. Not that I'm fixated on Barbie dolls. Um, a couple years ago, they, got, they, they um, got caught. There was lead poisoning in some of the toys that they made. Um, they were required to abide by new, new regulations, new um, restrictions and, and oversight of how they were making their dolls to make sure that there wouldn't be lead poisoning. Mattel's solution was, to this was to go to Washington to lobby on behalf of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, which would require every single one of their competitors, including companies who had not made children's toys with lead, to have to comply with these new burdensome restrictions that had been put on them in, in, in response to the mistake that they had made. Um, to add on top of it, those regulations that were created, which have put all sorts of small toy manufacturers, small businesses out of, um, out of business, Mattel then lobbied and got a waiver from the legislation that made all their other competitors comply with the burdens that they had to produce because they were already complying with those um, burdens. And after a couple of years, once the regulatory um, uh, uh, compliance that had been put in place on them went away, Mattel now doesn't have to abide by this legislation. Um, my favorite concept is the concept of the toll booth. We all learned in fourth grade how legislation becomes law, maybe um, a little bit updated, but you have congressional um, committees. They look at legislation. They mark up legislation. They pass it out of committee. It then gets put on the floor, um, and it's voted upon. And the one part of that that you don't learn about is that nothing goes on the floor until the majority leader um, of the House of Representatives, the, major the, the majority leader of the Senate, decides to place it on the, on the, on the floor. So a couple years ago, there was something called the Wireless Tax Fairness Act. And it passed easily out of the Judiciary Committee. It was very uncontroversial. It eventually passed very easily through the House of Representatives. But it took six months to get from committee onto the floor. And the reason was that John Boehner and Eric Kanner were waiting for, for, for co campaign contributions to come in that would pay the toll booth so that they would allow the vote so that the legislation should go forward. And coincidentally, within three days of the vote actually happening on the floor, Verizon and AT&T and the other wireless communications company gave $200,000 of campaign contributions from various high-level executives at the company to John Boehner and Eric Kanner. I could go on and on and on about all the ways that money is laundered through Washington, D.C. People think that we have campaign contributions. Companies can only give five dollars to $10,000 um, to a politician. How could you possibly buy a politician off for five dollars $10,000 when it costs millions of dollars to run a campaign? And the answer is that 97% of House incumbents get reelected. So if you give $5,000 to 200 people, you've actually given a million bucks. And then the 97% who are safe can all then give $5,000 from their campaigns to the candidates who are in tough elections. And now a company has given a million dollars. It is organized, it, it, is, it is polite um, money laundering that if we saw in a third world country, we'd have a problem with. Um, small example just to kind of cap it off. I went to Stanford. I got my MBA there. Two years before I went to Stanford University, um, they revised their core curriculum to add a class alongside finance, accounting, marketing on how to lobby Washington, D.C. You can't be a business leader today if you don't know how to play this game. Now, I'm not saying anything profound. I think hopefully um, most of you know this. You learned this in PolySci 201. Uh, the problem with democracy is you have this problem of very specific benefit, very diffuse cost. Um, and that, that's the problem of democracy. I do think it's worse than, than it's ever been um, in our country today. Government in, it intrudes into our lives in so many ways. Government spends $3.7 trillion per year. Government has a regulatory burden of a trillion dollars. The uh, tax code today is longer than the King James Bible. And so there is all this opportunity um, for government to intrude in there. And I think you know, one of the, the greatest examples I can give um, is an experience that Microsoft had in 1997 
um, with Orrin Hatch, who at the time was the head um, of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And Microsoft was facing an antitrust case. Um, they had basically taken something called Windows 95, which none of you have heard about, um, and they had preloaded on it Microsoft Office, and the Justice Department was saying that because the penetration of Windows 95 is so great, um, that this is basically an antitrust situation, and they went in and tried to prosecute. So Orrin Hatch, the Republican head of the Judiciary Committee, had a hearing, and he had Bill Gates there, and he said, you don't get it. Microsoft is not playing the game. And if you want to succeed in business today, you've got to succeed in politics. The very next election cycle, Microsoft's campaign contributions went from $50,000 to $2.3 million. And since then, Microsoft has been a very active player in the, the game of politics um, that goes on in Washington. Um, and finally, this is something that the Republican Party um, and the Democrat Party, frankly, have deliberately created um, a market for. When I first went to Washington back in 2004, um, the big thing that was being talked about in Republican circles was Tom DeLay's K Street project. And the idea was that we have all these corporations, they've been lobbying Washington, D.C. for decades, but if we can get our people into those corporations, then all of a sudden all of the lobbying interests will no longer be for big government um, and what they've been for in the past. These companies will start lobbying uh, for Republican principles and they'll be supporting our, our side. Um, which is precisely why you have the situation today where I think the Republican Party basically stands for big government as long as it's our government, which therefore by definition makes it good government. Um, so hopefully I've made you a little bit more cynical, or if you already were cynical about Washington, then just stay where you are and, and the rest of the um, conversation will make sense. Um, but I do think that this situation is especially tough for the Republican Party. Um, in theory, the Republican Party is supposed to be the conservative party. It's the party that stands for limited government. And so I can see how kind of intellectually it makes sense for a Democrat um, who sees Washington as, as largely having some responsibility for solving problems to say, look, if there's a regulation that's necessary, let's come get um, the best thinkers together. This is uh, why Woodrow Wilson said that the philosophy behind the Declaration of Independence was outdated. Um, we're going to get them together, and if people are lobbying, then the smart bureaucrats and politicians can figure out who's right, and they can kind of govern from Washington. If you're a Republican and you're allegedly in favor of limited government, you're allegedly in favor of taking power and, and pushing it down to the states and to localities and families and individuals, um, a Washington, D.C. where billions and billions and billions of dollars is being spent to lobby um, so that politicians can accumulate power that they use to then choose those winners and losers um, kind of exacerbates a tension within the party that's existed for 70 years. Um, it existed in the 1950s when there was a fight between Taft and Eisenhower um, as to whether we should roll back the New Deal, which Taft argued, or whether Eisenhower came out with his new republicanism that embraced the New Deal and moved on. It was at the core of the fight between Nelson Rockefeller and Ronald Reagan um, as to whether the, the Republican Party should stay the party of Richard Nixon, who imposed wage controls and the EPA and all sorts of other um, uh, stuff that nowadays would be the wet dream of Democrats, um, but came out of Republicans. Um, versus Reagan, and is, is part and parcel of all the tension that exists today um, between what are called establishment Republicans and uh, Tea Partiers, conservatives, whatever it is. And the solution for a long time to this has been that politicians come to Washington, they say one thing, or, or they go home, they say one thing to their constituents, and they do very different things once they get there. And there's all sorts of tools that they use to do this. So earmarks were a big issue 10 years ago. And essentially the question was, how do you get a bunch of Republicans to vote for a farm bill um, that takes 1930s Soviet-style agriculture policy um, and imposes it all around the country. And the solution was you give them something that they can take back to their district, a new bridge, a you know, monument to themselves, a rainforest to Iowa. Um, and they go home and they say, yeah, we voted for this farm bill, but look, we got this new road and that's fantastic. And you focus on the road and nobody's uh, any of the poorer. Um, they would come up with distractions. In 2003, the big fight was the Medicare prescription drug plan. It was the first new entitlement ever passed uh, uh, since LBJ, done by a Republican president, Republican Congress. Um, and, they f and they said, well, let's not focus on the new entitlement. Let's focus on health savings accounts. Made a big deal out of the health savings accounts um, and used that to pass the first new entitlement. Um, or they just do flat out show votes. And they, they do something that lets them run campaign ads saying they stand for something um, when they stand for the exact opposite. We saw this a couple months ago. I don't know if it made its way up to the, the purple value, but there's a big fight between Ted Cruz and Mitch McConnell. Um, and the core of that fight was that Ted Cruz um, claimed that his position was we didn't want to raise, that he refused to vote to raise the debt limit unless we did something to control the fact that our spending is out of control. Um, 
Mitch McConnell claimed to have the exact same position as Ted Cruz, um, but actually had a, a different position, which is an entirely intellectually defensible position, which was, look, spending's out of control, but an election is six months away. Um, and so I'm not going to vote to have a fight over a debt limit with all the media talking about default and um, all the other kind of um, uh, arguable, if not false, um, things that come around a debt limit. I'm not going to do that six months uh, before an election. And the only problem is Mitch McConnell didn't want to say that. He had a primary coming up. Um, and so he needed to figure out a way to pretend to have Ted Cruz's position while actually having Mitch McConnell's position. And the solution was an agreement that we just wouldn't vote on it. Um, there'd be unanimous consent to move on, and then all the Democrats would vote um, no when it was a 51 vote threshold. Um, and so this is how you go home as a politician. You claim to your constituents that you're against raising the debt limit, even if you are in favor of it. Um, Ted Cruz objected to the unanimous consent thing, and it became a, a big fight where the Wall Street Journal criticized Ted Cruz and everybody else. Um, but McConnell got his way. Um, so those are basically the tools that, that politicians in Washington use to avoid having an honest debate to keep the kind of cynical, perpetual motion machine running, to take care of the interests um, that fund their campaigns, million dollar campaigns. Um, and it's why I'm incredibly depressed about the 10 years that I've spent um, kind of playing this game in Washington and watching you know, uh, George Bush come and for, in one instance on Social Security reform, try to do the right thing, get absolutely no traction um, with politicians who didn't want to take those um, uh, take, get involved in that tough fight when there were more important things to do, like spending $500 billion on transportation bills and, um, and renewing farm bills. Um, but it's actually why I'm actually very excited about the future. Um, and so I hope, and this is not a kind of throwaway, I do hope that many of you look at getting involved in politics. I think that politics will be transformationally different in the next 5, 10, 15 years than it has been in the past. Um, and the reason is that I, I, I authentically think um, well, first off, I would trade shoes with any of you all. Being in college is, is awesome, and, uh, and, and I miss it very much. Um, but the greatest time to go to college was 15 years ago when Justin and I left home and, um, and Andrew and, and came to, to Williams. Um, and the reason was that we were at home, and we had dial-up modems. It would take 30 seconds to get on the internet. And if you wanted to download a song, it would take five minutes to download the song, and you'd find out that the file was corrupted, and you'd have another five minutes to download the song. And then you come to Williams, and it is like this mecca where you have T3 lines, and you have this awesome thing called Napster. And so we li I, I had, when I was in college, my friends had, when I was in college, literally every single song ever written downloaded on their computers. And if there was one that you didn't have, you would download it in four seconds, um, uh, and you'd have it playing for free um, before you could even change the track. Uh, and this completely transformed the music industry. In 1995, the five big record labels, some of which don't even exist today, had 85% of the profits in the music industry. Today, the ones that still exist have 23%. Today, um, the uh, young kid I'm forgetting who was found on YouTube, um, Justin Bieber, <laughs> who never would have been discovered in the musical world 20 years ago, where talent was found by the same record labels, that, pr that produced the music, that promoted the record, that distributed the record, and captured all of the profits. None of this happened in the music industry before technology, before the internet. Um, and what you see happening right now, I think there's a lot of friction in Washington, D.C., why I'm very unpopular for putting out a scorecard that says not just how a politician wants his voting record to be perceived, but what his voting record actually is from a conservative standpoint, is you see the monopoly the political parties have on framing votes, on choosing candidates, on having election happen, being totally disrupted in the same way that led to literally billions of dollars um, of lawsuits being filed against Napster. Um, you have politicians who in the past were used to being able to choose who the primary candidate would be for their party. And it was going to be Charlie Crist in Florida, or it was going to be Trey Grayson in, Indiana, in, in, in Kentucky, um, not your, or uh, David Dewhurst in Texas no longer having the ability to choose the candidate. Instead, you have Ted Cruz, and you have Rand Paul, and you have Marco Rubio, um, who have actually given authentic voice to what the party is supposed to stand for, um, those principles of free enterprise and everything that everybody talks about. They go every four years to the Reagan Library and talk about how they're the successors to Ronald Reagan, um, but authentically coming through. You have votes that are going on in Washington, where for decades, people got away with going home and voting for a bill that was 80% food stamps and saying, well, we voted for a farm bill, and we come from a square state and a square district within the state with lots of farms. And so don't worry about the food stamp spending. Focus on the fact that we brought home the bacon uh, for the farm bill. 
And you had all of these various tools that I talked about that politicians would use to hide their voting record that are now being totally disrupt disrupted um, by technology, causing gargantuan weeping and gnashing of the teeth, um, much of which is directed at me, um, for exposing their voting records, but is fundamentally not allowing a party uh, to get away with trying to be something that it's not. Um, and I focused on the Republican Party. This is not exclusively a Republican Party thing. When I was at Williams, um, the Democrat Party, the Democrat base, was violently against the war in Iraq. Um, at the time, every, you know, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, Al Gore, the leaders of the, of the Democrat Party were supporting the war in Iraq. The, the, probably the most influential book in going to war with Iraq was a book written by Ken Pollack. He was the Middle East um, uh, chief on, on President Clinton's national security. Um, a, a, a council called a Threatening Storm, the Gathering Storm, the Threatening Storm. Um, that was the case for the reason that we needed to go to war in Iraq. And so you had a situation where you had a party that, that had a base that did not want to go to war. Politicians who would try to get themselves into these kind of, or would get themselves into these verbal pretzels of John Kerry saying, well, I actually voted for the 87 billion before I voted against the 87 billion, reconciling themselves with the position they had in Washington, D.C., we're going to go to war. Um, with the position their base wanted them to have, don't go to war. And what happened over time was you had nasty primaries. Joe Lieberman, the vice presidential candidate of the Democrat Party, primaried by Joe Sestak, losing the primary, eventually having to run as an independent. A far more uh, painful primary than anything the Republican Party has gone through over the last couple of years. You had the rise and fall of, Harold, of Howard Dean. Um, who almost got, uh, uh, got the Democrat nomination until John Kerry and others quickly found a way at the end to get on the right side of the issue of, of Iraq. You had Barack Obama, whose um, statements as a then little known um, Illinois state legislator would not have been made by any other candidate in 2008 because they had been prominent enough not to say what Obama said about the war in Iraq and, and how unwise he felt it was. Uh, and so you had a 10 year period where the Democrat party of Bill Clinton, the era of big government is over, of, of um, uh, Harold Ford, um, who is a very moderate uh, uh, Democrat from Tennessee, uh, was totally wiped away. Now you have a Democrat party of Bill de Blasio um, and Barack Obama, who I think is uh, far to the left of, of what Bill Clinton was in the 1990s, and we can talk about that if you disagree, um, that was fundamentally changed by an environment where the Democratic grassroots uh, have been empowered. And, and that's what we see going on with the Republican Party. Um, I happen to think it's a good thing. Um, I think that having ideologically logical parties allows people to have choice. People have the right to know that Republicans in general stand for X and that when they get to Washington, D.C., they do X. Um, Democrats stand for Y when they get to Washington, D.C., they do Y. Um, I believe that if you have that type of situation, the American people ultimately will choose. Um, but I can't prove that. Um, it's entirely possible that our system is set up for gridlock and that a authentically conservative and authentically progressive party um, will not be able to solve their differences, um, and that's a problem for future people to deal with. Um, I do think that if you look at the evidence, um, and you look at something like Paul Ryan's budget, which introduced a concept of premium support um, into a failing Medicare system, the conventional wisdom is that Republicans shouldn't have done it. Um, right after the vote happened, Fred Upton, who's the powerful chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, said this vote was the biggest mistake we made, we're gonna get killed in the elections for doing it. In 2012, Mitt Romney did better among seniors than John McCain had done four years earlier. I'm not aware of anybody uh, in the Republican Party right now afraid that they're going to lose their election in 2014 because Paul Ryan started an ideological fight um, about changes that we can make to Medicare. And so I think that if we actually have an honest debate in Washington between progressives and conservatives, I'm sure I'll lose some of them. Uh, I'm sure we'll win some of them. Um, but that we actually have a chance of solving the real problems that America faces rather than keeping this perpetual motion machine alive um, that, uh, that, was in, that was created and, and successfully does deliver goods um, to special interests who dominate Washington. Um, so those are my thoughts. Appreciate being here and uh, look forward to the conversation. Yeah, if you're looking to uh, to kind of to, to change the Republican Party so it has a, a greater you know ideological purity, how do you capture the moderate vote? Um, and what what strategies do you use? Do you you know convince them of, or how do you convince them of the necessity of it? Right. Uh, so I worked for Rudy Giuliani in 2000. I am the biggest rhino in Washington. 
Um, I am not looking for ideological purity. Um, I'm looking for a party that has enough confidence in its message that it goes out there and tries to win the debate. Um, the only way to win a debate is to have a debate. The only way to have a debate is to start one. Um, and the problem with the Republican Party, um, and for a variety of reasons we can go into, um, well, I'll go into them now, um, is that they don't start these. Um, at the end of the day, leaders of, of, of uh, especially congressional leaders, do not care about the same elections that you and I care about. Um, John Boehner is not going to lose a primary. John Boehner is not going to lose his general election. John Boehner very well may, probably will, lose the, leader, the race to be speaker next January. It's an election that the vast majority of Americans won't pay attention to, um, but it's the one that he's thinking about right now. Um, and the question is, if you start a difficult debate, um, if you do what Scott Walker did in Wisconsin and say, look, we have a major issue with public sector unions in this country, um, and I'm going to be the speaker who takes them on, you have now taken, depending on the issue, 10, 20, 100, 200 members of your conference, um, and you have pissed them off because now they, who face real primaries and real general elections, have to take a stance on, a position, on, on an issue that was not an issue until you decided to make it one, um, and some of them will lose their seats. Uh, and those don't matter, they're not voting in the next speaker's race, but everybody else who spent money on a closer race, everybody who was friends with the guy who lost his seat, is now upset that you did it. Um, and so the, the, the problem is that I actually think you can win elections if you stand for something. I think that people aren't looking for the most conservatively pure, the most liberally, uh, progressively pure politician. They're looking for somebody who's willing to stand up, make the case that this is the right policy, and win the argument. Um, and you see it with all sorts of governors on both sides of the aisle, taking strong stands, winning the argument. You don't see it in Washington, you don't see it in Congress, um, because that is just taking something that should be an easy election. Let's get Speaker Boehner back in there as Speaker, because he kept me from having to take politically embarrassing votes for the last two years. Um, and, uh, and now you're making it a tough Speaker's race. So the Speaker doesn't care about the same elections that any of us in this room does. Yes, sir. It's been reported that Nothing that has been reported is true. It was reported in the New, New Republic that I'm an a-hole. <laughs> that uh, he told Elizabeth Warren, if you're an outsider, you can say anything you want. If you're an insider, keep your mouth shut. If you want to accomplish anything. So my question is, does she have a chance? Can you build a grassroots movement within the system? Yeah. So, so I think that it, it would have been impossible 20 years ago to build a grassroots uh, network inside outside the system. I mean, just think of the logistics. Um, so I'll find out that a vote's going to happen on Thursday. Um, on Monday, every, every Monday night, we have a conference call with 1,200 community leaders around the country who are part of our network. We'll say, look, this is the vote that's coming up on Thursday. We need you all to do everything you can to activate your influence networks, as we call them. Call your member of Congress and tell them, you know, vote yes on HR 87 or whatever. Um, on Tuesday, we'll send out an email to our email list alerting them. On Thursday, we'll send out an email saying the vote's happening. And on Friday, we'll send out an email saying, here's what happened. Call your member of Congress up and either thank him or not. Imagine the logistics of doing this 15, 20 years ago, right? I, uh, you have some page, I guess, who's you know, sitting over in, in the Capitol and runs back to our office and says, hey, they just announced a vote's going on. Um, we get our lithograph machine up and running. and you know, put out 300,000 vote alerts, stuff envelopes, hope that the Postal Service gets them there by Thursday, um, and that people are willing to pay a dollar a minute, whatever it costs, to, to make a long distance call and call their member of Congress. You could not do grassroots organizing 20 years ago. You could not raise money um, through the internet the way you can today. You can send, you know, nine emails, nine emails for a penny, um, so you can hit nine million people for 10,000 bucks, whatever the math is. Um, on that, and the math starts making sense that if, you know, 7% of those people come in and give you 25 bucks, that doesn't work if you're paying bulk postage um, to raise money through the internet. So I think there's an incredible opportunity um, for people who aren't coming up through the traditional power structure of the party, um, which means that when you're a committee chairman, you are not pushing legislation that the Speaker of the House is now embarrassed not to bring to a vote. Um, uh, because it's, it's something that appeals to, to lots of people. Um, uh, and so it's just a, a different dynamic. And so I think Elizabeth Warren is not going to um, rise. Ted Cruz is not going to rise through having paid the, you know, been the safe vote, the vote that <coughs> Goldman Sachs comes in and says, look, this person's acceptable to me. 
they're going to, to rise because they inspire people around the country, that they get into a primary and a whole bunch of voters say, you know what, this is actually what I thought our party stood for. And I think it'd be awesome to have a, uh, you know, let's have a presidential election between Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz. Um, the country has some major decisions to make and, and that would present it. So I, that may have been a rambling uh, answer, I, I, or at least I feel like it was a rambling answer, but it was impossible um, to rise in politics in any way, kind of pre-internet, but for playing the game. Um, and I think what you see right now with Rand Paul, with Ted Cruz, with Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren, you saw it with Howard Dean in 2004, is people trying to come up with a different path. It's happened at the Senate level, and, and we'll see if it can happen at the presidential level. How does uh, the Citizens United really change the game in Washington, do you say? Um, so I don't think it has. The story of the last, billionaires will have a way Billionaires will find ways to impact elections, impact legislation, no matter what the rules are. Um, I understand you know, Michael Bloomberg is, is controversial right now. I, what I find interesting about Michael Bloomberg is here's a guy who has somehow gotten away with spending a billion dollars to get elected to higher office three times, one time changing the rules. Spent billions of dollars then pushing issues that as mayor he cared a lot about, and now has the chutzpah to run around and say that one of his big issues is getting money out of politics. I mean, if you can imagine if George Soros or the Koch brothers had literally bought, you know, if the Koch brothers had decided they wanted to be governor of, of Kansas and spent a billion dollars um, becoming governor of Kansas. But look, Michael Bloomberg, David Koch, Charles Koch, George Soros, they are always going to be able to get money into politics. And the rules of campaign finance are just about how transparent and how easy is it for them to do it. Um, the person who can write an $8 check because they saw Ted Cruz give a speech or they saw Elizabeth Warren give a speech and they were inspired. Um, that's the person who's been disenfranchised in every civilization that has, that has existed um, prior to now. And they are the people who are funding some of these campaigns that come out of nowhere um, and knock off Dick Luger, who is an incumbent, knock off Bob Bennett, who um, was an incumbent. And so I think the story of the last 10 years is not Citizens United or the Supreme Court case a couple weeks ago, it is the mass enfranchisement of millions of people who were previously voiceless. Uh, I grew up as a kind of a liberal, you know, Democrat, working for Stevenson, voting for Kennedy and McGovern and so on. I, I see kind of a whole temper difference with Obama. Obama is genuinely hated by so many people. I can't quite understand it. Is he the new Franklin Roosevelt? I mean, why is Obama hated so much? Well, look, I, I, I disagree with President Obama on a lot of stuff. We live in a time right now where uh, the amount of vitriol in our politics is that I go on you know, Fox News or MSNBC, either one, and my Twitter feed explodes with people calling me a racist. Um, I was on Fox News with Juan Williams a, a month ago. And in the lead up, Fox News tweets out, you know, coming up this Sunday, whatever Juan Williams' is, um, Twitter handle is, and Mike Needham and everybody else. And the amount of hate coming from the right towards Juan Williams is disgusting. Um, and so we live in a time where people, I think in part because we don't have honest debates, we have these kind of pretend debates where one side gets upset about Halliburton, the other side gets upset um, about, you know, Benghazi, and there may be real issues, and there are real issues on some of those. Um, but there is such a desire to throw up a shiny object that your side can get upset about to avoid having a real debate, which you might lose, um, that I think it feeds this kind of culture that's, you know, pretty gross. So, you know, I, I disagree with Barack Obama on, on virtually everything. There was one thing I thought of a couple weeks ago that I agreed with him on. Um, but, uh, you know, I think he's a good man. Yes, ma'am. So, correct me if I'm, like, oversimplifying your <coughs> argument, uh, but it seems like you're saying there's two parties, and there's like the politician side of things and there's the people side of things. And the politicians are where we're corrupted and, and this sort of like internet idea, this grassroots idea is gonna help the people take back Washington. Um, and I guess what I'm wondering is, and I don't, I don't expect you to have evidence for this, um, but how, to what extent is this sort of grassroots movement just motivating people who were already interested in politics and who already like sort of had their ear to the ground in that way? And then like what extent are we reaching out to people who you know, have never been interested in politics and who look like just don't care what happens in Washington? Yeah, so I think there is no reason for people who aren't already invested in the system um, to care about politics because it's boring and it's pretend. 
Um, and so I don't have much evidence that um, a campaign out there to honestly have uh, a debate about the future of the country um, would motivate more people because I've only lived in this country um, and it hasn't had that. I think that Paul Ryan um, presented an interesting plan to change, premium, to change Medicare, to have a premium support uh, model that is the type of debate that our country um, deserves. My guess, and you know, we can only find out by trying, is that more people at Williams College would care about politics if there was actually a chance that the Washington political process was about ideas and not about uh, kind of fancy ways to keep the gravy train rolling for um, powerful special interests. And I'm sure, you know, Professor Crow or somebody can teach me how to do uh, econometric analysis and prove my theory. But look, it's not happening. And What's that? <laughs> Steve Shepard from Econ will teach you that. <laughs> I knew you were a knucklehead 12 years ago. I thought you'd grown up. <laughs> I can't call on you now. Is that me? Well, it, it was Justin, but you can yeah, go first. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, so thank you very much for coming and speaking. Um, I'm very over my head here, um, but I really enjoy coming and hearing everyone. And I'm wondering, um, let's say we have, we, we get um, this perpetual motion machine stopped and we have these transparent and honest debates that we're looking for. Um, what do you think are the most important debates that we need to be having um, right now? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, first I'll answer that and then I'll, I'll maybe clarify my remarks. But uh, look, we need to be talking about an entitlement situation in this country where Medicare and Social Security are literally bankrupting us. Um, 20 years from now, there is no money in the budget for anything, Department of Defense, Department of Education, name anything in the federal government that you support that's not named Social Security and Medicare, and there is no room for it. Um, I think we need to have a conversation about the Fed, which is just pumping money in, causing gargantuan inflation, um, uh, all to basically keep stock prices high and, um, and allow the, the federal government to monetize its debt. Um, we have a tax code that is, as I mentioned earlier, longer than the King James Bible, um, so that all sorts of carve-outs and, and social engineering from Washington can happen, um, but mean that it takes billions and billions of hours for people to fill out their taxes. So I think, you know, pick an issue and we need a debate on it. Um, I, I'm, not, not, I, I'm intentionally, um, and maybe insultingly to a college audience, trying to be uh, a little bit naive about the extent to which, you know, we can all sit down and have um, honest conversation because of the internet. I think that um, the incentives should change with more transparency where we are having better debates. Um, and I do think that we should be you know, having fully honest uh, debates. The fact that we have the same farm bill in this country today that we had in the 1930s, um, despite the fact that the, uh, the, the <coughs> interests that existed in the 1930s are different, despite the fact that new people have been enfranchised by the internet and otherwise, reflects the fact that Washington is not keeping pace with the types of change that should be going on. Um, and I think all of those changes point towards the direction of having more honest debate, more uh, real difference between liberals and conservatives, the type of stuff that um, happens here and that's healthy for our country. Um, and I think it needs to happen on you know, basically any, any issue that is debated in Washington or could be debated in Washington, privacy versus security. So with the interim in power of all these new groups, how will the, the Democrats and the Republicans contain all these new factions that you know, don't fit into the clear two-party structure? Well, at the end of the day, we, we live in a party system. Um, and there's a fight going on right now for the soul of the Republican Party between um, groups like mine and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and depending on what you think the Republican and, you know, a hundred other groups. Um, and so, you know, the people who vote in the party, the people who switch between parties, the people who throw their hair, hands up and say, um, I used to be a Republican, but I'm so disgusted with what George Bush did when he had the reins of power that I'm leaving, um, decide what the party looks like. And um, if my group can show that we can win elections because um, we're actually trying to solve the country's problems, that's great. If the Chamber of Commerce can um, raise lots of money and use it to buy elections, then that's, um, uh, that's you know, jolly for them. Um, and they can frame it in a different way when, when they're speaking. Sir. So, okay, so let's say what you say happens 10, 15 years down the road does indeed come to pass and you have a Republican party that looks a lot like Ted Cruz and a Democratic party that looks a lot like Elizabeth Warren. How in the world do you come together over Social Security or a farm <coughs> bill when the Elizabeth Warrens have to go back to their really fired up base and the Ted Cruz's go back to their fired up base? 
that are so far apart from each other on anything that both incumbents would get hammered in the next election if they, they went against them. If anything, I mean, like I, I'm, not, not, I'm not crazy about what we have right now, but I, I don't exactly see how the, your proposal yeah. gets us. So you have to win the argument, right? So I, so I think Paul Ryan has, has won the argument on premium support. It'll take 10, 20, 30 years. Um, the argument on premium support was going to be Republicans came out with a, Republicans just took over the House. They came up with a radical plan to destroy Medicare. They're trying to throw Granny off the cliff. Let's vote them out of office. Um, and instead, the issue basically went away after six months. Mitt Romney did better with, the, with, with people over 65 than John McCain has. It's not an issue in 2014. Um, I think that Paul Ryan has won the argument on premium support. Um, maybe not. I think that Scott Walker has won the argument that public sector unions have too much influence and that when you have a you know, private sector teacher earning $23,000 a year and getting nothing paid into their pension, and you have public sector union teachers in Wisconsin being paid three times more than that and having fully uh, paid pensions, that a lot of people um, start agreeing with the side that's making uh, more logical arguments. I'm sure that there's you know, plenty of examples of Democrats winning the debate. Um, my thesis is that if you go out there and actually try to, if you, if you start a debate, have a debate, and win it, um, a lot of stuff becomes plausible that, that isn't plausible um, today. If I'm wrong, we have gridlock, and um, that's what we have now. Start in the back. Um, I, I read a Pew Research Center study that really suggested that the internet um, was pretty much a sounding board for people's own ideas because they'd visit, you know, the sites on the right, you know, and stay there and, you know, pretty much get regurgitated back whatever their ideas are. Um, so, I mean, how, well, how can we really expect the players to change, you know, say, even if someone were to make it up, you know, into, into office when, you know, the special interest groups have such, you know, such power, how, how can they be expected to stay in office? Yeah, so, so it's, it's a different version of a question I get from conservatives all the time. They say, look, the New York Times is never going to give us a fair hearing. Um, how can we possibly win an argument? Um, I actually think that uh, there, there's no doubt that there's a sorting mechanism. I, wa I watch MSNBC every single night. Um, they basically talk about Chris Christie shutting down a lane of the George Washington Bridge. And if you watched MSNBC every night and that was the only thing you um, monitor, that's what you'd think. If you watched Fox News, the only thing that you'd think matters um, is Benghazi and, 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 you know, a couple other issues. If you watch CNN, there's a airline, a Malaysian Airlines <laughs> plane that I guess went down. Um, I, I think one of the best articles, so, so three years ago, there was a fight in Congress. Um, it was HR1, the first one after the 2010 election, um, to cut $100 billion out of a $3.7 trillion um, budget. The Republican House sent it over to the Senate. And Harry Reid went down to the floor and he said, cutting $100 billion is mean-spirited, it's draconian, and it will cut the Cowboy Poetry Festival. Um, the, New York, the liberal New York Times ran a front page story um, because that conflict had caused Harry Reid to talk about the Cowboy Poetry Festival on what the Cowboy Poetry Festival was. Um, it's a thing that goes on in Nevada. 1,800 people show up at it. They pay $71 in admission and they get a $7 federal subsidy um, to help keep the cost of admission um, uh, down. Um, I think every single person who read that article thinks that those people would pay 78 bucks to get into the Cowboy Poetry Festival. Um, and so I think that there's a laziness, at least on my side, I, I uh, come to you and confess I'm not the best um, to talk about uh, the Democrat Party. I think there's a laziness on our side um, to avoid having a debate because we don't think it'll be covered by the liberal media and therefore people who pay attention to the liberal media aren't exposed to our ideas. Um, I think that what Scott Walker did in Wisconsin move the ball forward for, uh, for conservative ideas because he started a debate that couldn't help but be covered. Um, I you know, am credited with having been a player in the defund effort of this uh, past October. There are more people who are paying attention to Obamacare from all across the aisle, including people who don't pay attention to politics because they'd rather watch Dancing with the Stars because something happened. It forced them to actually pay attention to politics and form an opinion on Obamacare. And that was true regardless of where they're getting their news. Um, and so I think that um, there's no doubt that um, there are different sources of information. I think that there's certainly good that comes from that. I'm not sure that the world that we lived in 40 years ago where three network news anchors get to choose everything we cover um, is any more ideal than one where Fox News and MSNBC can create different versions of the facts. Um, but the only way to solve that is to actually cause debates to go on the other stations 
um, and you know, do crazy stunts like defund that uh, force everybody in the country to pay attention to Obamacare. Sir. But at, at what point is it, I mean, you want to have these ideological discussions, but I would argue, you know, at, at what point is it more than just being dead horse? It's running that dead horse over with a Mack truck. I mean, how many times have the Republicans voted to defund Obamacare? Once. 48, 49, 50, I've lost track. I mean, like, at that point, you're not making an ideological argument. You're just, you're creating publicity for your base, creating this more polarized atmosphere. You're pissing off the other side, who's like, why are you wasting our time doing this? And you're wasting government hours doing things that just it's never going to accomplish anything. Yeah, so I think that if you view Obamacare as a federal takeover of our healthcare system, <laughs> Um, whereby uh, people who currently have coverage that they're happy with no longer have their coverage because new rules are put in and every single plan is supposed to require, it, it has to cover a certain basket of goods, um, that there are certain things that are worth fighting for and stopping Obamacare is one of them. It's a total myth that the Republican House has voted 50 whatever times to defund, repeal Obamacare. There's, I think, eight different pieces of legislation that have changed Obamacare that the President of the United States has signed into law. So there's a requirement that small businesses have to file um, burdensome forms that the president, the Senate, and the House all agreed should be gotten rid of. That's included in that um, number. There are changes to you know, what IRS agents are allowed to collect in terms of information that haven't been signed into law. And then there are, I think, you know, uh, don't quote me on the numbers, but three, five, seven different votes to get rid of Obamacare and, and ultimately in um, last October to defund it. Um, and over the course of the last four years, I think it has been important that the Republican House continued to make the case that there is one party who has done everything they can to make sure Obamacare goes forward, including shutting down the government, preventing World War II veterans from, from visiting their fallen soul, uh, brothers um, at the World War II Memorial to make sure that Obamacare goes forward. And there's another party that's done everything it can, including playing a part in a government shutdown, uh, to try to stop it. And I guess we'll have the 2014 election, the 2016 election, the 2012 election. Um, to start litigating that, to keep litigating that. Yes, ma'am. What, what do you see as a viable alternative to uh, Obamacare? Like, once we repeal, how do you go forward? Sure. So we have a, um, a, a anomaly in the tax law caused by World War II, where companies were not allowed to increase wages um, uh, during the war, uh, but they were, by an IRS ruling, allowed to increase health care uh, spending um, to compete for employers that creates an, inc an incredible advantage uh, and incentive to buy, to buy and overbuy health insurance through your employer. Um, I think that we need to fix that so that people who are buying health insurance from their employer, from, the free, you know, from an individual market, from their labor union, from their policeman's benevolent association, are all buying health care on uh, health insurance on a, on a market. I think we should be able to buy health insurance across state lines. If you look at what's going on with car insurance where you watch the Super Bowl and there's all sorts of advertisements saying, I give you better, health uh, better auto insurance at a lower cost with better coverage. We should be having that in health insurance. Um, I think that you know, there's all sorts of plans out there on the Republican side, from Tom Price's plan to Tom Coburn's plan, Heritage Foundation, something called the 2017 Project that Bill Crystal runs. Um, Bobby Jindal, the governor of Louisiana, has a plan. Avik Roy, who's at the Manhattan Institute, is coming out with a plan in two weeks. I think there are all sorts of ideas about what a free market health insurance system looks like. Um, if you want to increase the access to something, you increase options um, uh, and lower cost. Um, Obamacare increased costs and limits options, and that's why we're seeing a lot of people lose their, their health coverage. Yes, sir, in the back. Oh, boy. Uh, kind of where, to where to start. Yeah, but I'll, I'll keep it short. I actually have some political experience. I graduated about 20 years before you, worked mostly in Bond Act issues campaigns, a few candidate campaigns, and that was kind of enough for me. But um, a point and then a question. Uh, for a long time, I've always looked at and called campaign contributions bribes. I think, by and large, they fit the bill. They fit the definition. Uh, in the last year, though, I've been reading um, and learning a little bit about another way that it's a two-way street. Uh, somebody named Peter Schweitzer, maybe you know him, has written a book called Extortion. Mm -hmm. I got here a little bit late. I don't know if you mentioned that. But a lot of what he writes about, even if you take it with a grain of salt, shows that a stalemated system is good for business, the business of being in power and running for office. And so I put my own experience together plus that element now, and I just wonder if even with 
you know, we have the time where Tip O'Neill and Reagan were able to get some things done, where Clinton and Newt Gingrich and Bob Dole were able to get some significant things done. And I just, I'm not as optimistic. Um, Republican who has voted Democratic, very disappointed in uh, Mr. Obama, who I, I did vote for once. Um, but I also listened, for example, to Mark Levin, who um, <coughs> upsets me at times, but definitely challenges me, and I think he uh, does his homework. He's talked about a convention of the states, not to be mixed up at all with a constitutional convention. Totally different ideas. The convention of states is provided for Article 5 of the Constitution. I've even read up some on it. I'm not optimistic it could happen, but boy, he is beating the drum on that, and there are some reports from states. Uh, maybe you could just inform people yeah. and give us some so, so I think, you know, Mark's a great guy, Mark's a friend, and, and I disagree with him on the convention of the states. The Constitutional Convention started off as a small thing to kind of tweak uh, the Articles of Confederation, um, and it up, ended up being a lot more um, radical. So I certainly uh, share Mark's concern for the future of the country. Um, but I'd be pretty concerned about having a new constitutional convention. You say it's not a constitutional no, I, I, convention. No, it's a convention of the states where, as is provided for in the constitutional convention, I'm not lecturing, I just want to be clear because it gets, I used to get it confused. Right. No, I'm, they, I'm the states come together well after an Article 5 certain, convention. Right, certain percentage. And all they can do is offer amendments to the constitution, which right. then have to, they can't open up and say, you know, we want to change the world. No, and, and just. To continue the point, that's exactly how the Constitutional uh, Convention started in 1787. So look, I'm, I'm all with Mark that we need to be, um, I think the country's heading in the wrong direction. We need to be op open to solutions. I think going to an Article 5 convention is an extraordinarily um, risky strategy. I totally agree. It was um, the bulk of my remarks about everything you said about the role of money um, in politics. And uh, um, I would only quibble with you that I actually think money in politics is free speech, not uh, um, anything else, but but anyway, I'm skeptical of an Article Five convention. Justin, Mike, now, now you've got like the modem sound in my head. And right. You feel really old by talking ding about dong, ding dong. Um, so you mentioned Fred Upton, who was here actually <laughs> last week, this week, whenever it was. Last I week. I forgot about that. I learned uh, that six months ago. What's that? His his daughter's here. Son. Son. Um, so he was here for a talk last week, and uh, it seemed that every other word out of his mouth was bipartisan, or mm -hmm. bipartisan shit, or some version of it. Um, and so I, I wonder what you say to those people, right? I mean, on the one hand, you have this grand vision of sort of Republicans and Democrats or conservatives and liberals sort of battling it out, right? And, and presumably, despite your, you have to win the argument, there's going to have to be some, I don't know, compromise, whatever, in there. Sure. Um, what do you say, and it's not just Upton on the right, right? I mean, President Obama on the left, right? This sort of cult of bipartisanship that surrounds diagnoses of what's wrong with Washington, mm -hmm. right? You ask most pundits, what's wrong? There's not enough bipartisanship. What do you say to that? How do you counter that? What's your argument for why that's wrong and how, why we should think of it? In a right, so we live in a nation right now that is a, um, a peculiar blend of two radically different visions of what government is. And one is the system that the founders set up, and I'm not by quoting the founders, I'm not saying it's the right system or the wrong system, uh, but it is one of limited federal powers um, with a Tenth Amendment that li limits the powers given to the federal government and uh, gives the rest of them to the states, which all sorts of checks and balances with annual appropriations, which means that if there's a disagreement over some, um, I, guess, I guess it's, uh, I think it's Federalist 57 um, that talks about the reason we have annual appropriations is that if there's a big disagreement over policy, you can have a government shutdown um, to litigate it and a different system that Woodrow Wilson and the progressives brought in 100 years ago, um, where Woodrow Wilson said the only problem with the Declaration of Independence was the philosophy of the Declaration, which is the preamble, um, which says we hold, all, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created and equal, that are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable powers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he felt that in the modern era, with all of the things that social science had learned, um, that actually bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. could better solve problems um, than people back home, uh, you know, living their lives their own way. And there are two very different views about the proper role of the federal government. I think it does a disservice to just say that bipartisanship is the solution. I think that bipartisanship and compromise um, from a position of, of having had an argument and won the argument is how, is how good legislation gets done. I think bipartisanship from a position of weakness and not having tried to win an argument um, compromise from that position is begging for your life. And I think that as long as the fetish is to just have compromise, it's unlikely that we actually move the ball forward on anything. 
I think that if you actually go out, try to win a debate between two vastly different philosophies, and on some issues, you know, I think all issues, my side will win, and then you say, all right, post-debate, how do we you know, write this into legislation? Um, I think that's how you move the ball forward. But to, to, pretend that we don't, to pretend that we have two parties, well, we do have two parties right now, which are after the same thing, and it's basically to um, stay elected in Congress long enough to then get a high-paying million-dollar job on K Street so you can then lobby your former colleagues once your lobbying ban is over. Um, but to say that we have two uh, political philosophies in this country um, that are just naturally open to sitting down and having a scotch and figuring out what to do about Social Security, um, I think does a gargantuan dis disservice um, to the difference between what well-intentioned progressives and well-intentioned conservatives believe. Yes, sir. Uh, if Paul Ryan won the argument on premium support based on kind of the kinds of evidence you, you put out there, how can, why, why couldn't we say that Barack Obama won the debate over Obamacare by getting reelected in 2012? Yeah, I mean, because we're, you know, I mean, look, Paul Ryan, Ryan has not won the argument on premium support in the sense that um, it hasn't happened yet. And so I'm, I'm certain that I overstated my case there. I think it is inevitable 10, 20, 30 years from now, given the changes that need to happen to Medicare and given the array of options that are out there, um, that we will have something like premium support in this country. Um, Myself and the majority of the American people think that changes should happen to Obamacare. Um, Mary Landrieu, who's running for uh, Senate in Louisiana, Kay Hagan in North Carolina, all agree that there need to be changes to Obamacare. Um, changes in Obamacare happen virtually weekly, coming down through executive order by the President of the United States, whose law is not working. Um, and so I think it's something that is continue and does continue to be a, an open issue. But I don't, I don't pretend to, to actually believe that Medicare is over. Um, I think that until an, a serious alternative is, is presented to premium support, um, Paul Ryan has won the argument that there's um, no better solution to it. But fair question. I was told to make sure that uh, I, at 8.30 you guys want to wrap it up or take one more question. One more question? One more question in the back. Uh, you talk about the, uh, having a, a, a debate and an argument on an issue with letting you know, having that settled, but don't you find that a lot of the arguments are really disingenuous and that they're based on emotion, uh, manipulating people, rather, uh, this is on both sides, rather than having an actual intellectual debate? Absolutely. So the purpose of politics is to create a fight where your opponent takes a vote on an amendment that you can spin in a 30 second ad to embarrass him. Um, and I think that's all the incentives that we have in Washington. Um, that's the problem and, and that's what um, an increasingly cynical public isn't going to accept. And I think it's very healthy, like I disagree with Jon Stewart on a lot of stuff. I think it's healthy that he embarrasses people um, on his TV show for playing silly games. Um, I think it's healthy that that happens because our scorecard is, is you know, uh, exposing votes that are show votes. Um, I think the more access to information people have out there, where people who are playing silly games that demean democracy get exposed for it, the better. Um, and that's why I'm excited about uh, the direction that we're going. Thank you all. I enjoyed being here. <laughs>